Honorable Dr. Leonard Walker and Judge Ginger Rand. Um, I want to share with you a personal story. I am a journalist and a lot of what I write is sometimes pretty ugly. And I saw uh, this lady uh, to my right. I, you know, I followed her on social media. I first heard about her when I wrote a story about an award that she received. And she didn't know me from anywhere, but I just kept, you know, observing her on social media. And every single thing that she posted was positive and uplifting and just something like I'd never seen before. And so I reached out to her and I said, hey, I'm a reporter. Um, do you have a minute so we could just have a chat? And I met her, and this is one of the warmest, sweetest, most genuine people I've ever met. Aww. And then I heard the story about how she kind of transformed uh, the judicial system and helped create a court that didn't look to punish people who had mental health issues, but looked to give them a second chance and help them. And it was just, it literally gave me goosebumps. And that's how I met uh, Judge Luna Rand. And I'm so incredibly pleased to be on this panel um, working with her today because I think like she's the real deal. And I don't know Dr. Walker very well. We just met today, but I told you guys I'm a journalist, so I kind of like to think I'm pretty observant. And while we were sitting in the lobby, I saw, I'm not gonna say too much, but I, I did see someone come sit next to her, introduce herself, and identify herself as a, a survivor of domestic violence. And that says a lot to me. It says to me that these ladies are the type of people that when you meet them, you feel safe to come into their presence and say, hey, Dr. Walker, you don't know me from Adams, but this is what I've been through, and thank you for your work. And so these are pioneers in their field. These are powerhouse, very powerful women, and also very humble women from what I can see. So I think we're all very privileged to be able to have this evening and share the evening with them and learn a little about their work. Um, Dr. Walker has worked all over the country, from what I understand, all over the world, and she's doing very innovative work. So I hope uh, you know, we can take this opportunity. I'd like to thank NSU for hosting this, for having me, for having mm -hmm. us. And I just look forward, like just the rest of you, to learning as much as I can and absorbing as much as I can from these ladies. So without further ado, I'm going to shut up and let um, <laughs> Associate Dean uh, Deborah Moss Wellwell come over and get the program started. Good evening. I have to agree that these, these ladies need no introduction, but please indulge me for a few minutes while I do so anyway. Um, it is in my honor to welcome you to Pioneering Women Making History in Psychology and Law. Um, we look forward to hearing from and discussing, engaging in discussion with Dr. Lenore Walker and Judge Ginger Lerner Wren. Please allow me to introduce them to you. Dr. Lenore Walker is a psychologist who has researched various forms of gender violence, especially battered women, sexual assault, sexual harassment, sex and human trafficking, and false confessions of women and child abuse. She is a clinical forensic psychologist who testifies in cases across the United States. She's involved in international psychology issues, having served as the chair of the APA Committee on International Relations and Psychology, as a member of the APA Council on Representatives, she is involved in the future of psychology on a policy level. She earned her BA degree from Hunter College of the City University of New York, apparently with my mother, <laughs> uh, an MS degree at the City College of the City University of New York, an MS degree at Nova Southeastern University, and her EDD at Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey. Through her research, she developed the concept of the battered woman syndrome, which is cited in cases of physically and psychologically abused women who have killed their abusers. Dr. Walker will read excerpts from her book, The Battered Woman, and the fourth edition of The Battered Woman Syndrome. Judge Ginger Lerner Wren. She's a county court judge in the criminal division of the 17th Judicial Circuit, Broward County. In what has been recognized as an historic order, she was appointed to administer and preside over the U.S.'s first mental health court in 1997, 
which has been dedicated to the decriminalization of persons with mental illnesses and neurological disorders. This court defines itself as a human rights strategy, prioritizing dignity and restorative justice, with goals to seek to divert mentally ill persons charged with misdemeanors and nonviolent offenses into community-based treatment as an alternative to incarceration. She earned her BA from the University of Miami and her JD from NSU's Shepherd Broad College of Law. Judge Lerner Wren is an adjunct professor at the NSU College of Psychology. She is an expert in therapeutic jurisprudence and problem-solving justice and speaks nationally and internationally on mental health courts and policy, therapeutic justice, and cultural change leadership in the law. And she is the recipient of numerous awards for her work in this field. She will be reading from her book, A Court of Refuge. Please give your attention to our stage and please help me welcome Dr. Lenore Walker and Judge Ginger Lerner Wren. Good evening. It's a pleasure uh, for me to be here. Um, this is my first time on Miniachi's stage, which is very exciting. Uh, although I've been on the faculty for 20 years and just retired um, last year. So I wanted to tell you a little bit, um, just as an introduction to some of the work that I've been doing. Um, there are two books that um, I'm going to do a little reading from. Uh, this is the very first book published in 1979 by Harper Collins. Uh, and they published it um, as, with me as pretty much of an unknown. It was not a popular topic in those days. Nobody studied it in school, and there was one research article that I could find about battered women, and they accused battered, this um, article accused of battered women uh, for being abused because they were frigid to their husbands. I was offended, as I'm sure most of you would be, and I said, that is not true. Um, I was working in child abuse at the time, and I, said, I knew that the women uh, that were getting blamed for the abuse of their children were also being abused themselves without any assistance or help. And so I decided to use my psychology training. I was working, lucky to work at that time at Rutgers Medical School, one of five women on a faculty of 40 um, people, mostly men, um, and I went around to all of my colleagues and said, do any of you know any battered women in the work you're doing? Because we all had a practice in addition to our training of, of uh, students. And all of them looked at me with a blank stare, like what was I talking about? I said, well, okay, any of you know of any of your clients who are being hurt by their husbands or partners. Oh yeah, everybody raised their hand at that point. So the whole phrase, battered woman, wasn't even a phrase that was being used at that time, nor was domestic violence. And we were talking about child abuse only. And people were blaming moms for the abuse of their children. So I set out to do interviews of women to find out more because I could not find it out in research and this is the result, the battered woman book. I went to London, to England. I met with the um, parliament because they were doing some research um, on uh, domestic violence at the time. I worked with Pat Schroeder, who was my congresswoman when I lived in Colorado, and got to, to work with her and came back um, and started hosting conferences and Within a few years, we had battered women shelters across every state in the country, every major city in the country. And with that, I started to collect more information. I wrote a grant uh, for the National Institute of Mental Health. They funded me back in 1978 for uh, $250,000, which was a lot of money uh, in those years. Again, I felt like I'm an unknown, how do you know uh, that I can do it? And I didn't know how, whether I could do it or not. Um, but I, we did, and we had a great, uh, a great um, research project that lasted for three years. Uh, and the Battered Woman Syndrome book uh, 
um, is the result of that research grant. Um, this is the fourth edition of the Battered Woman Syndrome book. Um, uh, when you get it in a, a new editions, uh, you're really getting new research. And I would say that um, about 50% of this book uh, was done, research was done here at Nova Southeastern University and the College of Psychology with my graduate students. And so it's a book that uh, many of you who uh, work and live in this community um, might be interested uh, in looking at. So I thought I would read a couple of passages just to give you some idea of what we were doing in terms of domestic violence research and looking at the psychological issues that affect people who live in families where there is domestic violence. And I was going to um, start with just a couple of definitions. Um, here in, in the Battered Woman Syndrome book, um, I talk about PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder. I named Battered Woman Syndrome from the grant that I wrote for NIMH, but I named it that because at the time we were talking about battered child syndrome. And because I saw them as so closely related, I just added that as a title. Um, I had no idea it was going to stick. Uh, um, so, but I understood that it was part of PTSD. PTSD wasn't in the diagnostic manuals at that time. Uh, so otherwise I might have named it something different, but that's the way it was. So what I wanted to read is, is um, for those of you who may have the book, it's on page 154, I say PTSD is the most commonly diagnosed disorder in not only battered women, but also abused children. Although some of the symptoms are not seen easily in young children who often show dysregulation of their bodily functions. Children who are sexually abused, and we think that there's somewhere between 40 to 60 percent of children who live in domestic violence families have either <coughs> physical or sexual abuse or very serious psychological maltreatment. Um, they are often conflicted emotionally. On one hand, they appreciate the extra attention from the abusive parents' grooming behaviors. But on the other hand, they dislike the abuse itself and the demands that are made on them. Many become alienated from one or the other parent as trying to please both of them becomes too difficult for them. Simply, sim some simply walk away from the family understanding that nothing they can do will make it all right for them. Lucy was a 15-year-old girl when I first met her as she was referred for a psychological evaluation to determine if she was capable of being legally emancipated from her parents and family. Lucy had been sexually abused by her three-year older brother since she was nine years old. Her parents found out after Lucy had a seizure in school at the age of 13 and was taken to the hospital where she disclosed the sexual abuse. Her parents, who fought with each other all the time, became angry with her when her 16-year-old <coughs> brother was arrested by the police and placed in a juvenile detention center. Eventually, he was sent to live with a grandparent, and Lucy was permitted to go home. However, her parents kept blaming her for ruining their brother's life and begged her to recant her story. Previously an A student, her grades began to drop and she was in danger of failing some classes. In psychotherapy and on psychotropic medication, Lucy refused to recant and angry with her parents for not supporting her, she ran away from home. This is not an atypical story for runaway children most of whom fail to get parental support when they disclose the abuse, particularly sexual abuse. Unlike those who often get picked on by sex traffickers, another area that we are studying um, that is described in the next chapter of this book, Lucy got picked up by security and taken to a juvenile shelter 
where she met a girl named Andrea. They became girlfriends and became physically intimate very quickly, each needing each other for emotional support. When I saw her, she had obtained her GED from high school. Instead of going to college, though, which had been her original plan, she wanted to get a job, move out of the shelter, get an apartment with Andrea, and never see her parents or family again. Her test results, however, indicated that despite some of the effects of PTSD on the way she was thinking, her intellectual abilities were still very high, and she probably would succeed in a college program rather than getting a job with which she might get bored in a very short period of time. If Lucy remained in state custody until she was 18, she could receive state support to go to college, provided she got good grades. If she were emancipated, then she would lose these benefits. So a better resolution for Lucy would be to apply and be accepted to a local college. And if she wanted to remain with Andrea and move into the dorms there with state support. The difficulty was to make it clear that until she was ready, even if it was never ready, she should not be forced to be reunified with her parents, whose betrayal of trust was fundamental breach in their previously dysfunctional relationship. This turned out to be much more complicated than expected because the rules say that the parent, you must be in, in um, contact with your parents. However, with a strong lawyer and a judge who really listened to the best interests of the child when I testified and did not try to compromise with the parent's best interests, things worked out well for Lucy in the end. So you can see we took, went from the psychological issues that um, approached the battered woman uh, to um, the children growing up in those families and trying to help them go on to have a successful life. In another chapter, we talk about some of the relationships with other people that um, those people who have been abused end up having. Sometimes they have difficulty with um, what we call attachment, meaning they don't have friends, uh, usually because of the isolation that they're forced into during the time that they live with a batterer. And so um, part of what we do um, is to look at what is going on for the person um, and we look at the fact that there's a lot of sexuality issues um, in and attachment issues. Again, we've developed some psychological assessments to help us understand where that person is and what we can do in psychotherapy to help them get on with their life. Almost all of the battered women that I've worked with over the years Almost all of them um, have all the skills that they need, but they have been so traumatized that they don't always have the ability to use them. So working with them in psychotherapy can be fun. May I uh, stop you there for one second? Sure. How do you get them past that? One of the things you mentioned is isolation, and it seems that makes sense to me. If I had been through what she had been through, I don't know that I'd let anyone in. How do you break through to that and get them, you know, stop the cycle? Well, I, it, it's a very good question, and it differs for each person. Um, the first thing I do is a good assessment, so I know um, from what she tells me. Sometimes she doesn't tell me very much because she is still feeling betrayed by other people and not trusting me. I understand that and give her the time and space that she needs. And so it is the relationship that's so important. And I know that uh, Judge Ginger will tell you the same thing in her court, because I've been in her court um, and watched how she relates uh, to people there. And I think that's the key factor. But you also have to have patience. You have to have the skills to understand what the person really is, when she's ready. 
I always say to my graduate students, timing is everything in your doing therapy. You have to really build to, to there. Now, some of what I do um, is deal with trauma memories. And um, I was going to talk a little bit about that, but let me talk first. First, I want to talk, tell you some of the more exciting work, because the most exciting work that I do is testify in court when a battered woman has killed her abusive partner in what she claims is self-defense. These cases are extremely complex and difficult because many of the women um, who, by the time I get to meet them, has not had the opportunity to trust anybody. They're scared, and for almost all of them, uh, that at least the ones that I work with, they only kill out of desperation. And I want to make it clear that domestic violence relationships are not all bad. We think about them defining the relationship with what is about um, battering and, and abusive behavior. But there's also very loving behavior that goes on in those relationships as well. It's exactly the cycle. And that's one of the things we measured very early on was that um, cycle of violence. And so you, if um, she doesn't want to kill him, she just wants to stop the violence. And so I have to do a job um, talking to the court. I just was up in Melbourne um, last uh, two days ago. Um, I didn't get a chance to testify. Um, because the, uh, just the, like in many cases, it just goes on and on and on. So I have to go back again. I can't say too much about the case. But what I can say is what my report, which is already in evidence, says, and that is, in my opinion, she was a battered, the woman was a battered woman, and her family was seriously affected um, uh, by this. So I, I wrote another book. Um, and uh, on page 303, I talk about these women who kill in self-defense. Um, I wrote another book called Terrifying Love, Why Battered Women Kill and How Society Responds. And there, I interviewed over 500 women. I wrote about 100 of them um, in the research projects. And it really, by working with the most serious violence that ends up in somebody's death, what it shows, it, the, it, it's so glaring, because most, thank goodness, most cases don't get there, but it's so glaring, you can see the escalation of the violence, how it got to that point. And of course, um, as a psychologist, um, I try to look at that and to try to um, uh, work with that and, and testify. Um, so in each of these cases, there were numerous points when some intervention would be made, it wouldn't have gotten to that ultimate conclusion of death and destruction to the people and to the family. Um, most of the women felt that no one took them seriously, that they alone had to protect themselves against brutal attacks, and they knew by observation of the men's observe, uh, changes that they could observe in the men's physical or mental state, that this time he really was going to kill them. They were able um, to sense that. Um, most of the time, the woman killed the man with a gun. Almost always, it was his gun, and he gave it to the woman, assured that she'd never use it, but telling her to do so. And then, of course, was shocked when she did. Um, m many of the men actually dared or demanded she use the gun on him first, and then he was going to kill her with it. That doesn't make any sense, but it didn't matter at that point. When you're in the middle of that kind of a crisis, um, uh, it, it doesn't, you don't have to make sense. Um, in my opinion, many of those deaths were set up by the men um, themselves, much like we often talk about death by a police officer when they taunt a police officer to kill them. Some women had made suicide attempts, um, but most of them um, have very little memory 
of what they were thinking about other than an intense focus on their own survival. Um, and retrospectively, you could see that the women should have been more angry with the men, but they weren't. Um, their descriptions of the final incident indicate that they separate those angry feelings by the psychological process that we call dissociation. And in this field, we do a lot of work around the whole issue of dissociation, and the new diagnosis for PTSD now includes dissociation. We just finished um, a research uh, uh, analysis of, of the last 10 years um, of working with over 200 women uh, who uh, were battered, claimed they were battered women, and um, we went in and interviewed these women and had uh, maybe two to three hour interviews with them and some test results uh, of them. Uh, and what we found uh, was the same thing that I found in the earlier research project. So things have changed, but yet they really haven't changed all that much. That's what I'm thinking when you're talking. <laughs> you know, you, you use the word frigid, which I don't think anybody in this room has heard in 100 years. I know. <laughs> um, so it, it, it says that we've come a long way and we're in the age of Me Too, but how far have we come really? You said one of the biggest things is that no one believed these women or, um, you know, uh, validate what they're saying. Yes. Is that still the case, even in this day and age? Are people still not being believed? Well, you saw what happened with the, um, the uh, hearings for the uh, latest Supreme Court justice. Mm -hmm. um, people kept saying, oh, yes, we believe her that she really was abused, but it couldn't have been him because mm -hmm. he's such a nice guy. Um, many of the batterers are very nice people. Um, if you're not married to them and you're not in their radar for abuse, um, you like them. They can be very charming. They can be, uh, and so the women don't even think anybody's going to believe them because they feel that they only see that public face rather than what really goes on behind closed doors. And most of us don't know what goes on behind these closed doors. I want to talk just a minute or two about um, trauma memory um, because I think um, that's very important and it's a really important part of trauma therapy. And I have a couple of chapters here talking about what we do for an evaluation and why we do it. Um, Trauma-specific treatment, we have two kinds of trauma treatment. We have trauma-informed treatment which is providing a safe place for somebody to come in who has been traumatized, not just battered women, not just people who have been affected by gender violence, but also any kind of PTSD or trauma treatment. You need to have a safe space in order to feel comfortable about going through those memories. We know now that research has showed us that there are two memory centers in the brain. Without getting too complicated, the major memory center that most of us are aware of is in the cortex of the brain, the old, the, the, the part that differentiates us um, from other creatures. But there's another memory center in the midbrain area that is where our emotions are seated. It's in the hippocampus, and it's modulated by a number of um, chemicals, biochemicals that are secreted in that emotional system. Uh, it, it is also part of our autonomic nervous system, so it works automatically. We don't think about it, and it doesn't rely on language. The uh, memory center in the cortex of the brain relies on language, whatever um, language you use. And it, uh, things don't go in exactly the way they occurred. But in the hippocampal area, things go in like a photograph, but a photograph with other senses. So you also smell, you, you have the same smells, you have the same um, vision, uh, you may have, have associations that are around you when you have been traumatized. Rape victims, for example, um, know what's happening because it's in the hippocampus. 
The problem is because it doesn't have language, you can't get it out very easily. Some people always have that memory. Some people have it and don't have the access to it. But it's there. Part of what we do with trauma-specific therapy is we move that memory in the hippocampus area and we help our clients put labels on it. You know, if any of you, when I testify in court, I try to explain to the jury, if any of you have ever had a document in your computer and you forgot to save it, label it, and it disappears, every now and then it pops up. You know it's in there. And it, it'll bother you because unless you catch it, that's not gonna, you don't have control over it. And that's what happens to trauma memory. And that's what we try to do in our psychotherapy. So that's another thing that we did um, with uh, uh, our students here at the College of Psychology. Um, and Dr. Jungerson, who is sitting here in the audience, who's also on our faculty, um, we devised, I had put together a survivor therapy empowerment program to work with trauma survivors. And Dr. Jungerson and I um, revised it and made it much better thanks um, to her uh, contributions. And we are now in the process of using that program in Broward County jails, particularly in, in women in distress at the Batter Women's Shelter. Um, and uh, we've just gotten an article published uh, in the psychology journals that really supports uh, that work. So uh, we're very excited uh, about uh, what we've been able to do uh, here at the university. And uh, we write about the program itself and the different th um, areas that we work with. Uh, it's a 12-unit program, but it can take uh, each unit can take more than um, one session. So um, you can use it, the minimum would be like uh, three months or 12 weeks, but most for most people it's gonna be four to five weeks a month or maybe more. Um, so we're lucky when we, we can work with, with people who can do that. Um, and the, thir the last one I wanna tell you before, um, I don't know how much time I have left. She said, I have time, good. <laughs> um, is we're working with um, women who falsely confess to crimes that they have committed when they haven't committed them at all. Now most people think, how could you possibly say you killed somebody? Because the cases we've been researching have been murder cases. Um, how can you say you killed somebody if you didn't do it? I mean, most of us who have not been abused would never do that. But when you have been abused, you have learned to give in to things even when you know that they're not true because for a lot of these women, they wanna go home. And they believe when a police officer evaluates them or, or, or talks to them, they believe that they will be able to go home to their children. Of course, that doesn't happen. Um, and um, many of the women have actually confessed to killing their children when it was really the batterer who was the abuser and did the, um, committed the homicide. And so we have been going through a number of those cases. We have over 100 of them now. And I write about that um, uh, in the fourth edition of the book as well. Uh, so if you're interested in following up on them. So I wanted to close by just reading a case, if I have the time. It's a, a little long, but I'll try to skip through some. Um, and the woman who gave me permission uh, to write about this case, and, and by the way, now that I've retired and do, still doing my research, I'm now writing mystery novels. <laughs> so you can look on my website when they get published. Maybe they will, maybe they won't, but I'm having the best time writing them because it's fiction and I can make these cases end any way I want them to. <laughs> I have total control, unlike what you really have with the legal system. So this is a, a story. Um, the woman tells me, the reason I'm telling you this story is to help other girls so they don't make the kind of mistake I did because I never dreamed in a million years that I would. I was married in 1970, she said, on my 18th birthday, 
and I thought I was very much in love. I had known my husband for about nine months. My mother agreed with anything I wanted to do. My dad was a, against my getting married. My husband's father worked for my dad, so that made it a little touchy. The first year we were married, we all got along very well and did a lot of things together. I had no idea he was physically violent until six months into our marriage. Before we were married, however, he did threaten to burn down my house and kidnap me if I didn't marry him. He also threatened to kill my parents. In a way, I believed him, and in a way, I didn't. I knew he was capable of real cruelties, but I never thought he would inflict them on me. So typical a story. Um, I realized he would when one night, when one of my girlfriends called, who he knew didn't like him. She wanted to go out for lunch and to go shopping. Making my own decisions, I said that was just fine. Later, I told him who it was and what I had said, and we got into a violent argument, which ended up with him throwing me across the room. He didn't do that much physical damage. I mean, I was bruised, but I think my ego was hurt more than anything. I threatened him, never again will you do this to me. And he swore up and down that he never would. Thinking about all this is something I did to suppress in my memory. It is hard to dig it all up now, although there are episodes that will always be in my mind. Later on, he turned out to be an alcoholic, and he didn't work. He'd drink all day and smoke dope while I supported him. Good reason for leaving him, huh? Anyway, one morning, I wanted him to take me to work. He had been out real late carousing around and just didn't want to. I reminded him that he said he would take me to work, and I got mad. I really tried to hang on to my patience and my tolerance until there was just nothing left but to get mad. Then the same thing happened. He gave me a real mean, nasty look and slammed me against the wall. I can remember a couple of other times where I would wear a short sleeve dress to work and people would say, what's that big bruise on your arm? I was real defensive and nervous about it. A couple of guys who knew me pretty well asked, did Doug do that to you? And I would say, no, 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 I deny everything. I had not told my parents or, any, or his parents what was going on. Anyhow, this time I called my mom and asked her to take me to work because I could see he was stronger than I was and there was no arguing with him. I had a bloody nose and I was crying so my mom wanted to know what had happened. I finally told her that Doug did it. Of course, her little girl is her pride and joy, and she was hurt. She went up and talked to him. He was still hungover, and he tried to knock her down the stairs. She was really shocked and got hurt in the incident, but neither of us told my dad. He had been against the marriage from the start. It was my mother who allowed me to get married. After Doug realized what he had done, he calmed down and apologized. That's the third phase. So you can see we have the tension building and the feeling of danger, the actual acute battering incident, and then the loving I'm sorry afterwards. Not all go through that cycle, but many do. He gave, um, I, I, um, I was crying and my mother wanted to know what had happened. He was still, okay. He, um, as usual, he talked his way out of it and smoothed everything over. I agreed to go, I'm going to shorten it a little bit. I agreed to go to California with him. I didn't have a job there, so I was depending on my father's connections and his business to pull me through. I can remember a few other times where he hurt me but it's so far down in my memory, it only comes up every once in a while. Sometimes when I, recall th I try to recall things, I can't. Um, there was a long period of time when he didn't hurt me when we went to California, but I was the one who always had to go out and make money and make the world look better for him. It was a pretty rough time. The more he drank, the more violent he got. I tried slugging him back. 
but I learned he could hit harder and it was no use because he would just use it as an excuse to hurt me worse. Oh, you hit me first, he'd say. You nag me, he'd say. Um, I would um, try to get him to straighten up, and I meant well, but this also made him very abusive. He wouldn't let me associate with my friends. If I'd write letters, he'd want to read them. He's very controlling. This is the controlling behavior that, that really signifies a battering relationship from a relationship where people just don't get along very well. Luckily, I had a friend at work with whom I could t uh, talk. He was a teacher um, and was married, so he had a way with kids. And I, I showed him the welts and started crying, and he told me I was crazy for sticking around. I did go back home by myself on several vacations, and I came back with all sorts of enthusiasm and said, I'm going to do what I want. Nobody's going to think for me. He noticed that I started telling him no and told me, I will do your thinking for you. He got more controlling. One time a friend bought me a sweater, he ripped it off me. At this point, Dr. Walker, you're probably saying, oh, that poor girl. It's hard to laugh about, but it's something I think about once in a while, but I learned my lesson. All I could do was learn from it and decided I wasn't going to go back through that again. I filed a complaint, and I was completely fed up, and I got out of the marriage. Um, he didn't, I, I started to get out of the marriage. I'm not going to um, read the whole thing. Um, but towards the end, he wanted me to have an affair with somebody else. Um, but I wasn't raised that way, and I just couldn't do it. Um, last, the last night that we were together, he wanted to make love to me, and he kept wanting me to repeat um, uh, what a guy he saw me talking to um, had done. My husband told me that all a girl was, a, was was a servant who could not think, a receptacle, a piece of meat. So the next day, I stayed home, talked to my friend, and I decided that I was going to leave. And the rest of the story talks about how she was so afraid of him because the most likely time for a woman to be hurt more seriously or killed is at the point of separation. I really was afraid he was going to come after me. Um, but I went to meet my friend from work who drove me over to a, another girlfriend's house. And the next morning, I flew back home to my parents. I was relieved to be back with them. They were very happy to see me. Not all parents are going to be there for women. Um, but right now, I'm living by myself. I'm learning to live self and, and to um, uh, enjoy it. I'm much happier now than I was when I was married. I do know that I suffered more psychological damage than physical abuse. Um, I was really scared by lots of things that he did for me. I'm afraid of men now, and if I see any kind of temper in a man, that denotes it could escalate to any kind of physical violence. My first reaction is to cringe, and I won't have anything more to do with him. These are some of the PTSD symptoms um, that she's describing uh, in, a, in a way that helps me understand that what she's telling me is a story that is probably very true um, because it comports with all the things that we know about domestic violence. My mother's also having some psychological effects because she blames herself for letting me marry him. I have talked to him on the phone since I left him. He called and said he lost his job, is still drinking, and is 70 pounds overweight. It's really too bad, um, but even though he's a smart person, um, he's not really going to be okay. All of the things I've been talking about really did happen. 
Um, I just couldn't believe somebody could be that way. I didn't want to believe any of these things that we've been talking about really happened. A lot of my problem was that I kept thinking that I could do something to help things change and get better. From listening to my story, I know it sounds unreal that anyone would put up with the things that I put up with. But I did, and it wasn't for quite a while that I realized how stupid it was for me to hope for a change for the better. So here we see somebody who really escaped, still blaming herself some, uh, rather than blaming him for what happened, um, but gives us the kinds of clues that she's going to be okay. Um, she's got the strength and the ability to be okay, and that he didn't follow her and, and hurt her. And I believe that that's because she had supportive family and friends. So I want to close by saying that the most important thing when you're working or knowing somebody who is being abused is just to be their friend, to be there for them, because um, they usually know what they need to do. They just need the little bit of extra motivation and courage to be able to do it. And having friends helps them heal and get out of the bad relationship that they're in. Well said. Thank you. Before we turn it to uh, Judge Ryan, may I ask you this? Um, sure. For all of us in the audience, if you know someone, if you've been in the situation uh, yourself, I've been in the situation myself, and everything you're saying, when you're out of it, it seems bad shit crazy. What you were reading, I'm like, who would? And then I'm like, oh yeah, me. <laughs> <That's> a, <laughs> exactly. Um, when you're in there, it, it's your reality. How, is there something we should be teaching our girls, and our boys, because they too end up in horrible situations like this, is there something we should be telling them, like, this is a warning sign, this is a red flag? Is there something you can recommend, a different sort uh -huh. of conversation we should be having? I wish I knew. I think if I could bottle it and sell it, I'd be rich, you know? Um, there are things that we can do, um, some of which uh, some people can do. One is if you're not the first relationship that you have, ask his prior girlfriend. Uh, most of us think we're better than the last one, but truly, she knows. And so um, that's one of the things uh, that we can, we can um, teach people to do, especially um, if he talks badly uh, about um, women in general. Um, that was one of the things I saw in the Kavanaugh hearings. Um, I don't know if you go back and look at some of those pictures. He shoved his wife out of the way mm -hmm. so he could move. I mean, little things that you can notice. Are, um, doesn't mean that somebody's going to be a, a total abuser, but the issue is not just the physical abuse. Um, we all know what that looks like. The issue is the controlling behavior. It's the insistence that you do it my way and, and the way I tell you to do it. The, diff, the, the picking of, of your, uh, your friends uh, and not letting you be with friends that he doesn't like, or family that he doesn't or like. Clothes, like um, said, he said. Clothes, that's right. You know, you get, I had a, a client who, who um, he went out and bought all her clothes, dyed her hair a different color, and made her into his image, you know, and, and uh, that kind of controlling behavior is a clue, um, a really important clue, but uh, most of us don't want to see it. That's the hard part. It's because love, we think we're very in love with somebody, and we are. I mean, because these guys are not all bad. And love is blind. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's why we have those phrases, <laughs> is, the, is the truth. Um, so there are little signs that we can look for. But uh, most of the time, the, the men wait until you have made a commitment to them. That's when they start really giving you a hard time. So um, don't be surprised that people don't see it before. It's very difficult to see. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Walker. Thank you for your work and you know, even creating the language that we have today to describe these situations. We're so grateful.
And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Ryan. I'm Dr. Ryan. <laughs> I feel like a doctor sometimes. <laughs> I think we've been places, Lenore, where uh, uh, you know people would mistake me for a doctor. You know, this is such a thrill, first of all, and thank you all for coming. And thank Nova Southeastern University, Florida, uh, for having us and hosting this. You know, Lenore and I uh, have known each other. Uh, literally for almost 21 years, I will never forget the day when the courtroom doors opened and in walked this woman who, uh, in the middle of a docket, who told my deputy that she, was, she needed to talk to the judge. And she needed to talk to the judge now. And she, you know, made her way toward the bench and I'm looking at this woman. And I'm thinking to myself, what is, what, what is she doing, you know? And she comes up, in, interrupts the hearing, and she goes like this. I'm not making it up. And she goes like this. I have been sent by the president of Nova Southeastern University, Ray Ferraro. And President Ferraro wants to send you a message. And I'm thinking to myself, wait a minute. Oh, and, and, and then she goes, and then she goes, and I am, this is, this is the, the, the really the, the, the key point, and I am Dr. Lenore Walker, and I have been sent, and I went, wait a minute, wait a minute, Dr. Lenore Walker? Dr. Lenore Walker is in my courtroom. Never mind the message, you know. And it turns it's true. I'm not making it up. And it, and and I think I got off the bench and I and I, I told this story, you know, before at your, your reception uh, a couple of years, a year or so ago. But it's such a poignant, unforgettable moment in my life. Now, you know, I listened to we we've spoken. We've spoken all over the state of Florida, right? We've gone to so many of the campuses from Jacksonville down to. Kendall, uh, doing forensic psychology forums together with Dr. Shapiro and Dr. Gold and Tara, and gosh, we just had such a great time, but I think this is one of the first times that we're here, you and me, together, and it's the first time, you know, I used to always, over the years, I'd go, I'd go oh, Lenore, you know, you want to do something, what are you doing? Because I'm writing a book, I'm writing a book, well, finally, I have a book. <laughs> and, you know, so, yeah, finally, you know, I had to catch up. It took a little while, but I did it because I learned from the master. And what an absolute thrill. And I, I, I'm going to change, uh, you know, judges reserve the right to change their minds, uh, a little bit, and I'm going to start out with a, a short blurb, and it's really to honor uh, someone very special, and then I'm going to just go back, and I won't be taking all that much time, and, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, doctor, and um, so anyway, uh, for those that do have the book, or even if you don't have the book, this is chapter three, I'm only going to read a, a tad, a little tad, I'll stop. <laughs> and it's called Punishing Loss. Punishing Loss. In her early 30s, Catherine Steves was married with three children and lived in a spacious five-bedroom house in the western part of Broward County. She had purchased the house herself after working 15 years as a restaurant manager, an accomplishment that she took great pride in. But with the unexpected collapse of her marriage and mounting financial pressures, the stress Catherine was under became unmanageable. At the time of the divorce, although both she and her husband were working, money was tight. As conflicts over child support intensified, Catherine's mental health rapidly declined. Catherine conceded, I was an emotional mess, suffering from severe panic attacks and depressions that doctors would later diagnose as symptoms of bipolar disorder. Catherine's perception of life took a dark turn. One night, in the middle of a psychological crisis, 
Catherine walked out the door down the street and away from her home. She became a homeless person. It just felt like the world caved in, she said. I never considered that I might have been suffering from a mental illness. For more than two and a half years, she struggled to adapt to life on the streets. Catherine always strived to do her best. While homeless, she worked to build relationships and sought out people who could offer her food or a place to sleep. Catherine still cannot explain why she never considered returning home, and she barely recalls the day she walked into a novelty shop in a South Florida mall and stuffed five harmonicas into her bag. I don't get it, she said. I had never played a harmonica in my life. The only thing I remember is the day I appeared in mental health court. Why is that, I asked. Because it was the first time I realized I had lost everything, she said. And ladies and gentlemen, here is Catherine Steets. Whoa. Now, Catherine's story is amazing. Um, and I'm not going to go into any more detail. It's in, it's in chapter three of the book. But um, I just wanted to say for those that might be watching on video later in the week or whenever, that Catherine went back to college, um, got her degree in mental health counseling. She has been an extraordinary intensive case manager for the past 15 or so years wow. in Broward County, working with, with uh, Henderson Behavioral Health Center. She's on an assertive community forensic team. She is extraordinary, and it's an honor to have her, and I just couldn't resist sharing that if you don't mind. So thank you for that honor. I had uh, some qualms. Uh, about which uh, chapter or a vignette, because these are really vignettes. Uh, this is a court of refuge, Stories from the Bench, of America's First Mental Health Court. is published by Beacon Press. And my editors were very, very clear. Took me a while <laughs> to get their vision, but I, I did. And they really, really wanted me uh, to humanize uh, what we see, Lenore, every day uh, in mm -hmm. mental health court, and the stories, and as you say, these beautiful, beautiful storytelling relationships mm -hmm. that are built through the application of therapeutic jurisprudence, and TJ, as we call it, uh, in the field. And um, so uh, I thought, however, after consulting, that we would start, um, I guess, where we should, and that is at the beginning. So uh, this chapter is called uh, A Race for Justice, and it is chapter one, and it goes as follows. On Tuesday, June 24th, 1997, I took the bench as the lawyers and clinical team waited anxiously for me to call the first case. I said a silent prayer and nodded to my deputy to indicate that this new specialized division. The session held during the lunch break of my regular criminal division was ready to begin. We were embarking on a new journey in therapeutic justice. And someone you all know here locally, Howard Finkelstein, the catalyst for the creation of the Broward County Mental Health Court had envisioned a refuge for people arrested because of actions they had taken while suffering from mental illness and cognitive disorders. In order to create that refuge, I needed my opening remarks to be welcoming, thoughtful, and compassionate. As I called the first case, I never imagined that in fact a new system of justice was beginning. In truth, no one could predict what a mental health court would mean or what it could do. The first defendant, Roger, was in his early 20s and homeless. As the deputies led Roger into the courtroom, I realized he was not coherent. 
He had been arrested for causing a disturbance in front of a convenience store. His hair hung in long, unwashed tangles, obscuring his face from view. As the deputies led him to a high back leather chair in the jury box, where they seated defendants who were in custody, he released the kind of scream that indicates deep emotional pain. The deputy handcuffed him to the chair, which was attached to the floor. He began to shake, and his unintelligible sounds became louder. As seconds turned to minutes, his noises turned to screams. I tried to speak to him, but it was clear he had surpassed his ability to listen. All I could do was watch him. His screams continued, hollow and desperate, as though this was the only form of expression he had left. As he became more agitated, he pulled on the chair, trying to free himself from the handcuffs. I had no idea if a person could exert enough force to dislodge a chair that was attached to the courtroom floor. It was clear that there was nothing I could do from the bench for Roger, and in an interest of calming the situation, I stopped the hearing. I ordered the court staff to clear the courtroom, and since the courtroom had one door, we left the same way that Roger had entered through the front door. Most courtrooms have two entrances, one for the judge and another for in-custody defendants. So this circumstance was unique to this courtroom. Yet, the one door served as a reminder of the humanistic impulse that had led to the court's founding and my responsibility to ensure that human dignity as well as justice was served here today and every day the court would convene. In the, in the hallway, the court team huddled in a circle. Assistant State Attorneys Lee Cohen, Melissa Steinberg, Assistant Public Defender Doug Brawley, the Mental Health Court Monitor Bertha, Bertha Smith, and the Mental Health Court Clinician Greg Forrester. They waited in silence for me to do or say something. Keeping in mind the function of the court, I signed the first mental health court order for diversion in the hallway outside of the courtroom. The diversion order mandated that Roger would be transferred out of jail, where he had been kept for several weeks. The emergency transportation order directed the Broward County Sheriff's Office to take Roger from the jail to the nearest psychiatric receiving facility or hospital. The order required performing an independent psychiatric screening and assessment and provision of treatment under Florida's involuntary civil commitment law, also known as the Baker Act, if Roger met the legal criteria. Diversion orders are common to problem-solving courts. At the time that Broward began its mental health court, problem-solving courts were a relatively new development in the U.S. criminal justice system. Miami-Dade County, which offered, uh, Miami-Dade County had established the nation's first drug treatment court in 1989, which offered substance abuse treatment as an alternative to prosecution, incarceration, or other typical criminal justice sanctions. According to Bruce Winnick, a professor of law and the co-founder of the Science of Therapeutic Jurisprudence. These courts were created to address vexing social problems which were often driven by policy vacuums in our society. TJ offers the promise that a court acting as a therapeutic agent can respond to psychosocial pro problems as well as minister to the law. Judges who write diversion orders understand that there are vacuums in society that must be filled with new laws and options. According to Winnick, these vacuums may include a shortage of mental health services and a lack of sense of community, which results in society's ineffectiveness to address a wide range of social problems, which then get dumped on the courthouse steps. Sitting
sitting at the bench in the mental health court after issuing Roger's diversion order, I called the next case. The next defendant, Mary Stevens, was an elderly woman who appeared to be in her late 60s or early 70s. She had been arrested for trespassing at a gas station and had been in jail for approximately 45 days. I speculated that she was homeless. I glanced through the court file, which included an order by the originally assigned judge that declared her mentally incompetent to stand trial. There were no future court dates, no or other pleadings, and no defense motions for her release. Mary Stevens and her case had fallen between the cracks in the system. Ms. Stevens, I said, how are you doing? My name is Judge Lerner Wren. There was no response. I wondered whether she had a hearing impairment. I tried again, using the court microphone. Ms. Stevens, I said firmly, hello, can you hear me? I asked Greg, Greg Forrester, the acting in-court clinician, and a highly skilled community case manager to check on her. Greg, known for his mild manner and boundless compassion, leaned over the jury box to speak with her. We watched to see if she responded to him. As Greg tried to speak to her, I noticed that Mary's eyes were not moving. I yelled for my deputy to call 911. Something was wrong. Already shaken by what had occurred at the prior hearing, we all looked at each other in disbelief. How many people did Doug say was on the mental health unit? The individuals whom the court had already seen were in urgent need of mental health treatment or emergency medical care. Clearly, there was an urgency to see as many people as we could in the court as quickly as possible. Minutes seemed like hours as we waited for the emergency medical team to arrive. Finally, the paramedics rushed into the courtroom carrying a gurney. Two medics unpacked the medical equipment while the others began to triage Ms. Stevens. How long has she been like this, one of the medics asked. I have no idea, I responded. This is how she was when she was brought into the courtroom. I watched as the paramedics lifted her frail, unresponsive frame onto the gurney. There was really no way of knowing how long Ms. Stevens had sat unresponsive in a jail cell, nor how long the traumatic experiences and harsh conditions of living in the street had been draining away the person she had been. The first mental health court docket was over. It certainly was not what I had expected, and yet there was a sense of relief and pride knowing that individuals who needed psychiatric and medical treatment were going to receive care in a therapeutic and more appropriate healthcare setting. As we went our separate ways, I couldn't help thinking that everyone involved in the Broward County Mental Health Court had embarked on an unknown journey. And that's the end of uh, chapter one. So um, any time to do a little bit more? Yes, no, one questions? Questions? Questions, okay. Anybody have questions, comments? Catherine. Thank you. You know, I think that's a really wonderful question. You know, first of all, um, when you are in our courtroom, um, at that particular point, uh, there really wasn't uh, too many other mental health courts. At that point, uh, there were four known mental health courts. Uh, a few others came online, and then, um, as you may recall, uh, Congress used Broward County's mental health court and a court that was created in King County, Seattle, to pilot federal legislation to seed uh, mental health courts uh, across the country. 
And, and since that time, um, you know, fast forwarding to today, I think it's fair to say um, that mental health courts, quite frankly, are extremely popular. Mental health courts are the springboard for veterans courts. Now you have behavioral health courts. Um, there's hundreds of mental health and hybrid kinds of mental health courts across the United States. But interestingly enough, um, the mental health court model, and particularly Broward County's model, um, which utilizes a therapeutic and a human rights framework, is extremely popular in the UK um, and, around, um, and around Europe, primarily because of that human rights framework because they have the Declaration of um, Human Rights, uh, Declaration of Human Rights, um, that we uh, don't in terms of the uh, United Nations. And so I think that the impact has been extremely important because I recall when we first started the court, um, there was a tremendous amount of skepticism, and I think because of the stigma and the discrimination uh, surrounding uh, people with mental illness that quite frankly, um, there were a lot of, whis there was a whisper campaign. I mean, even in Broward County, you know, um, they would talk uh, about the crazy court. And uh, they did that until, you know, CNN and Good Morning America, you know, came in and all of a sudden, uh, I. Yes, and all of a sudden, you know, I think that um, the, it just seemed like when we started the court, as you may recall, I think we really hit a tipping point uh, in Broward County that what we were experiencing here in Broward County as a result of the gr a grand jury investigation uh, that I, I kind of skipped over that point, but in 1994, you know, Broward County went through a grand jury uh, investigation for being chronically underfunded, and of course, the criminalization of people with mental illnesses uh, exists largely uh, because of a lack of access to care and uh, fragmented systems and stigma. And I think that for judges and lawyers all over the country now, although we have a tremendous amount of work to do, uh, now you have, you know, courts and judges and, and beautiful collaboratives like we have in Broward County with Broward NAMI. Broward NAMI is here and all of our stakeholders uh, across both the mental health and criminal justice system. You know, now we really do, I think we've raised a tremendous consciousness uh, that, um, you know, we really understand behavioral health. We understand that no one is immune from mental illness. Uh, that one in five adults will suffer from a uh, serious mental illness over the course of their lifetime. And I, and I think that, that there is an extraordinary awareness now. Uh, and even as we face uh, here uh, in Broward County, in Florida, and across the United mm -hmm. States, uh, one of the most serious uh, crises, uh, both in suicide uh, as well as the opioid crises, you know, at the same time, I, 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 as you said, I, I, I think I'm the eternal optimist um, that we are going to catch up with ourselves, that we will find the champions, we will find the leaders like we have in the United Way uh, of Broward County and NAMI all over this country and mental health associations and all of these advocates that are working so, so hard and I really do believe uh, that my hope, uh, quite frankly, one day is we won't need mental health courts uh, because everyone's going to be able to access uh, mental health care as they do any other physical illness. And that is my, that is my wish uh, for everyone. It feels like we're closer to that, but I don't know that we're there. And I want to ask mm -hmm. both of uh, you ladies, what was it like for you, if you could just share with us on a personal level, uh, during the days of the Whisper campaign, during the days when you were one of five women in a room of 40 men, what was it like for you, you know, working and kind of creating the system that all of us have the luxury of benefiting from today? And how far do you think we have to go to get to the world that you'd like to see? 
You know, I'm, I just feel like I'm so fortunate. Um, I spend, I was, I was, I come from a civil rights sphere. Uh, I spent, I'm probably the only judge, uh, proudly, in the United States that literally spent about a year and a half in a psychiatric hospital. Um, not as a patient, but overseeing the implementation uh, of a federal class action that was centered around deinstitutionalization. And that hospital literally is about uh, maybe five, you know, 15 minutes or so from, from where we are right now. But it gave me the skill sets that when I came to the judiciary, my community was in trouble, uh, a lot of trouble. And we had a, ter a terrific jail overcrowding problem. We had a very high profile case of Aaron Wynn. Uh, this uh, book is dedicated to Aaron Wynn, the unlikely savior, if you will, and catalyst for the mental health court. And I just feel I, I was uh, you know, generally lucky to have so much support around me that they, we had no money, we have no grants. To this day, we have no grants or funding for the court. We've, we've diverted over 20,000 people from Broward County's mental health court, from Broward County's mental um, jail, excuse me, and the mental health court is part-time. I have a regular criminal division. So we've done very, very well to uh, take that many individuals and take them out of jail. Yeah, you can clap. You know, we all are working so hard for criminal justice reform and to reduce mass incarceration uh, in the United States. And, you know, we, the individuals that are sitting still in jails and prisons across the United States, there's essentially close to 400,000 people. Uh, with serious mental illnesses in our jails and prisons that are serving as de facto hospitals. And I, I guess I could, you know, tell some tales about those struggles, but I'll tell you the truth, I don't think it really um, is something that serves me. Um, what serves me more is to be able to share uh, the importance of access to mental health care, that we need to focus on prevention, and we need to be able to make sure that our children uh, and our parents and our grandparents um, across a lifespan, you know, understand and are able to get the care that they need. So for me, um, I just think that if there were struggles, um, I have really good friends, like I call in Noor, and I'd say, you're not gonna believe what happened to me today, and I just am so upset, and she'll giggle and say, you know, come on, stop, are you kidding me? This, go you know, this is the, you know, I've gone through this, and then you hear it, you hear it from Lenore, and you go, okay, you're right, move forward. And, I, and to, I'm lucky, you know, I have uh, warriors with me who have been through uh, through it, you know, there's this great uh, saying, and one of it's a it's a it's 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 a really great film if you remember it, um, but it's called Moneyball, and you know, there's this great line that says something about you know the first one through the wa war through the wall gets bloodied, and it's true. It's it wasn't easy. It's not easy, but let me tell you something. It's absolutely joyous to be able to innovate, and I encourage everybody, right, Sarah? We have Sarah's here from Broward Outreach, um, and we just had all these wonderful clinical uh, students in therapy that were over uh, working with you at Broward Outreach Homeless Shelter. They came into the court this week, and I did a little class. I love to use the court as a classroom as a teaching model, and, and my door is always open. If anybody wants to come uh, to mental health court, you're always welcome. And, and I was, you know, and I had this incredible group, collective group of students, and we talked about, and I asked them, how many of you here today are interested in innovating and repairing the world? And without one second of hesitation, every hand shot up. And, you know, this is what I really care about, that um, people in law and psychology and any other, in social work, in school nursing, 
Uh, I just did an incredible class at, uh, over Skype at Rutgers. And school nurses are going to be really the new breed of problem solvers. They are on the ground uh, seeing children every day, right, in school settings. And they're going to be able to identify who is experiencing adverse childhood experiences. You know, when is a stomach ache because they're afraid to go back to class because they're being bullied. And, you know, they'll be able to collaborate in the power of collaboration. So that is what gives me uh, tremendous joy. Well said. Nice. Um, and I, I certainly um, second the fact that we have good friends. Certainly, um, Ginger and I have, have been friends, as she said, for at over 20 years, I think. Um, one of the first people that I, uh, I met uh, when I came to uh, Florida. Uh, for me, I'm a bit older. I won't say how much older, but a little bit older. And um, I was, I sort of rode the crest of the feminist um, revolution, if you will. Um, I was always the first woman um, uh, in, in uh, where I was going and where I wanted to go. And it was acceptable. Uh, when I taught at the medical school, at Rutgers Medical School, I was on that faculty. And, um, you know, being one woman, um, there were five women and 40 men on, on that faculty. Um, and uh, they put up with my feminist uh, issues, partly, I think, because uh, Johnson & Johnson gave them a grant to get more women. <laughs> so I sort of was in that era when those kinds of uh, things were important. You had to have a woman around. Um, and I was uh, willing and, and loved uh, doing it. I really did not get into jail um, issues or jail reform. Um, until I married my, my husband, um, David, when, because he was um, chief psychologist in the, in the prisons uh, in Maryland and would talk about all of the things that were going on there. But, and I would go see my clients there, but I s sort of separated them out from needing the whole system reform. It didn't take me long to pick it up. Um, and I... Um, when I first started working with Ginger, I didn't really know what therapeutic jurisprudence was. You know, I You're would, an expert now. Oh, I am now, but <laughs> <laughs> thanks to you. <laughs> but I, I didn't really understand it. I have a good friend, another good friend, um, and, and my friends have sustained me, I will say, um, who likes to say, we have two eyes, because we use one to look forward where we have to go, and when we get discouraged, we have the other one to look backwards and say, wow, we have come a long way. When I first came to Broward County 20 years ago, um, the mental health services here were, in my opinion, non-existent. There were people who were struggling to provide services on a shoestring, um, not even a shoestring. Um, it was pitiful. Well, it's, it's still and, pretty critical. But, <laughs> you know, as 50 had funded in the United States, uh, you but know, we're, you we're... did a lot for Broward County with the mental health court to get people where there, they needed to, be. to get them where they had to go. And, uh, you know, I worked with, with the county in trying to get more things. Some of them happened, some of them didn't um, uh, happen. I still know we have a long, long way to go in this county uh, to really give people the services, the access to services, not even just the services, because we have people who can deliver them. Um, teaching here at, at NOVA, we have some of the brightest and best students that I've worked with in our master's programs and our doctoral level programs. Um, and they leave because we don't have enough to sustain them here. And so I think that infrastructure needs to be worked with. It's really, really important. We know what to do, but we don't have the money, and we don't have the support to do it. Um, but 
so that's my, my, where we gotta go. But I have to say that I was privileged. Um, my entire um, doctoral training cost me less than $500. Wow. I had funding. I, had, um, I went to Hunter College, as, as uh, the dean was saying. It was New York City. My parents said, we're living in New York City, and you're going to a New York City college because we didn't have the money um, to support any other kind of school. My master's at, at CCNY, I think I had to pay an extra $200. <coughs> in order to be able to get uh, education. And when I went to Rutgers, I had an Office of Education um, scholarship mm. that paid my tuition and, and, and paid me um, not a lot of money, but at least enough to live. My, my I was lucky. Um, when I retired last year, well, the um, school made me a beautiful reception, but I really pressured my students who were out there working, even though they were paying back huge loans, I don't care if you give $5, I want you to give money, and we, ha we raised $25,000 for a scholarship. Yeah, so we, we can do it. And, and um, I think we need to really take over um, the people who are not doing it and, and just do it. Uh, because we, we need to, um, and the scholarship is going to go to somebody doing the work that I've been doing. So, um, because otherwise they'll forget it. You know, something else will come up. It's going to be very more important. Um, but I wanted somebody who was working with gender violence um, and forensic work. Uh, they still haven't hired somebody to replace my, my position, but. Um, You're irreplaceable. Oh, no, they Just can do. They, they I, think, can I think we them. have some discussants um, here. Sandra, did you want to discuss? Uh, I, I think there's a microphone, microphone right, uh, the right there for you, if you don't mind making your way to the microphone. Oh, you're so welcome. <laughs> you're so welcome. And anybody who has questions, there's also a microphone on this side or any comments or anything you want to say? Okay, just a couple of things. Um, Why don't you introduce yourself? My name is Sandra Kumper. I'm the Executive Director of NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness of Broward County. I'm so honored to be here in front of these stalwarts and, and pioneers of uh, moving Broward County to the next level. Uh, I wanted to say, Judge Wren, I've had 11 years of being in the jail, like you were being in the hospital, working at the state hospital. I worked for 11 years in the mental health jail at North Broward. And one of the things that, ha that I realized there is first, a jail is no place for a person who is living with mental illness to be staying for any extended period of time. And therefore, it was very important for individuals to be given the opportunity to be in the mental health court and to be able to be diverted to programs and hospitals and or, or places home. that can be where they needed to be. Secondly, what I, what I realized also is that individuals in the jails was asking for to be sent to the mental health court. It was bad enough being in the jail, but when you are choosing to be in a specific court, it says a lot about who you're, being, who you're standing before. And the compassion that they, re they received from Judge Wren's court was the source of them asking to be sent to the mental health court. They didn't want to be in front of any other judge. They wanted somebody who could work with them, understand well, th that this was a mental illness that was pushing me to be in and out of the jail repeatedly. Uh, I don't, I don't, I'm hoping that the mental health court, especially your court, Judge Wren, is going to be around for a while. Because honestly, we are not there yet in terms of uh, getting rid of stigma, in terms of... Uh, having people that have the courage to talk about their mental condition and to get the treatment that they need. 
So we do need you, Judge, to be in that court for a little while longer oh, I'm to not work going with these. With our I, <laughs> I was just. I thank you. Uh, no, no, no. I just want to. I just want to say something. You know, just because the because the title of this program, you know, is, is women pioneers, uh, women making history, whatever. You know, in, in in psychology and the law, but you talk about the dignity piece, and I want to talk about that for a moment. Um, and how I translated, because every judge is different, every judicial, every personality is different. Um, and I remember getting the call, you know, from the chief judge. I was only a judge for about four months, and I was assigned to a criminal division. And I had never done a criminal case in my life. <laughs> and I asked the chief judge very politely uh, if he knew what he was doing. <laughs> Basically, like, are you sure this is where you want me? But of course, he already knew that the system, the criminal justice system, had already identified me as, even though I was a rookie judge, as someone who would have the specialized skill sets to try to do something. And that really links into what you're saying, Sandra, because we had no money. We didn't know for certain, although we had incredible shared vision amongst the stakeholders because there was a criminal justice task force that had been meeting for years although they couldn't reach consensus and they didn't have any money, um, Howard Finkelstein, and everybody knows Help Me Howard, right? Um, on our news show, and he's our Broward County public defender, and he's such a charismatic celebrity, and everybody was kind of, the story goes, everybody was getting so, and it's in the book, and everybody was getting so frustrated having met for several years, they said, well, what is it that you want, Howard? And Howard said, well, I want my own specialized bleeping court. And you can fill in the bleep. And you know, so here I am. And it was, we call it at the time a leap of faith. But going back to the dignity piece, I thought to myself, like in my mind, I was developing a strategy in case the court didn't work. And I thought to myself, OK. At the very least, maybe all of the operational, comp the complicated operational components of transporting, communicating, cooperation, getting access to community programs that never served a forensic population before, correct? Very siloed. Asking agencies not getting another penny to break their service models in order to now do more, if you will, with less. And so I thought, at the very least, I could give and promote dignity. I could help restore personhood. I could let NAMI families know and their adult children and everybody else that there was a judge that got it. And we might not be able to do it, but at the very least, we were going to try. And I was going to do everything I could to turn a court inside out. And literally, when people came before me, I would look at individuals. And let me tell you, they were shocked. Were you shocked? You were probably shocked, Catherine. People would come before a judge, typically a rather anxiety-producing experience. I mean, I don't even want to see me professionally. <laughs> <laughs> you know. And I would look at the individuals, and I would say, you know, welcome. You know, welcome, Ms. Steves. It's so wonderful to have you here. What can I do for you? And, you know, again, I just feel that the dignity piece of problem-solving courts, if you really want to gain a therapeutic outcome and you really want to work on that engagement piece, 
which, you know, this is about reducing stigma. This is about letting people know that you care about them. This is like saying this could happen to any one of us, including me. And, you know, using a court, I think, for that purpose and having that kindness uh, reign, if you will, I think it, to this day uh, remains the fundamental, most profoundly important uh, thing, quite frankly, uh, that I ever did in terms of a fidelity of that court. So I appreciate mm -hmm. you bringing that up. Yeah, I want to say something about the, the um, uh, we were asked, um, my, myself and uh, my graduate students, we were asked to um, assess the felony mental health court, um, uh, not the misdemeanor one, because uh, you had other people who were doing that. Um, and so we collected data um, from the charts in the, in the people who went through the felony mental health court for the first four years, I think, of, of, of the court. Um, and the records were very difficult uh, to, to utilize uh, because they were not kept the way researchers want you to keep records. They were, were kept the way programs often do because you're dealing with people and emergencies and crises uh, and researchers want it done perfectly. Uh, so it took us a long time to really analyze what we had. And what we found um, really shocked me um, that the court, um, despite they also had no major resources, um, were, uh, um, allowed, were doing a job where you did not have as much recidivism as you often have. You did not have people recommitting violence, um, violent acts. Um, at least we didn't see the records of anybody with that. And um, most in, in, importantly, um, we saw the waste of money and services trying to get people competent who weren't going to ever get competent. And, you know, that's what taught me we need, we have money if we would only revise how we're doing things. Because we could identify who would not become competent or stay competent. They might become competent um, for a little bit, but they wouldn't stay competent to, to participate in the legal system. That's, um, a, that's a, really, a really big issue, uh, quite frankly, that, that all jurisdictions are experiencing. But I just wanted to move on because we're getting short on time. And I just wanted to, I know, see Sarah. And then we also have uh, Catherine, I think, so after. Okay, Sarah. Hi, hi everyone, I'm Sarah Smith. I'm the supervisor of, clinical supervisor of um, behavioral health department at Broward Outreach Center and Miami Rescue Mission. Um, I wanted to say that 13 years ago, I met Dr. Walker and I never forget I have to say, 13 years ago, I was taking your hand, helping you go downstairs. I see you are younger than 13 years ago, and look at me. <laughs> now, um, it is an honor. I remember you, t you said that many people, many students, they leave after they graduate. But don't you forget, stayed. don't forget, because I've seen my interns, they take all that they got from you, and they are spreading it around. Um, uh, and that is why you are here, and that's why we love you. And it's amazing to see that. And Thank you, Sarah. About the a school, <laughs> that is so true. About the payment of a school, you may pay 500, but I had to sell my house to pay my student loan <laughs> two years ago. So you're very lucky. Those things doesn't happen anymore. Judge Ginger, I want to say thank you so much. Every year, this is something new that we start with our uh, program at uh, my internship program. When the student come to your courtroom, the day after I see that there are different people. The experience they get by seeing how you treat the mental health clients, patient, or whoever so was arrested for acting uh, you know, criminally, 
it makes their completely change their perception about what is going on in our society. Yeah, it's wonderful. I just want to say thank you so much for giving us this opportunity. Thank you so much for doing what you are doing. You are our role model. You know how many times I tell you, we love you. And I also, if anyone is here that is responsible, I want it to make everyone, um, all the students, to read your book as a mandatory part of their training. Uh, I'll second that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll second that emotion. <laughs> I, Thank I, you, I Sarah. I believe that would really make them understand what is going on in our society and will give, give them another way to help the mental Thank health you. patient in our Thank community. Thank you very much. The, your endorsement check is in the mail. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Anybody else? Questions, comments? Sure, Catherine. Could you speak a little you, louder, please? Are you, a, are you able to get to a mic, Catherine? Yeah. You're doing really great. When she talks about dignity, what she's not telling you is that just a few weeks before I was in her courtroom, I was in front of another judge who I told where to go so, and almost went to jail myself. So then when I went into her courtroom, my case manager walked me in and she said, Catherine, you're going to be good. Catherine, you're going to be good. <laughs> you're going to be good. And then she was like, Miss Steves, how are you? And I was like, wow. And I was not angry. But the anger that was in me back then, that's gone. Fantastic. Yes, well done. We're so proud of you. We're so proud of you. You know, I, I just want to, before we close, and I know we're going to close soon, somebody? Some, oh, sir, please. Well, I just have a question about uh, mental health courts and uh, assisted outpatient treatment. I was wondering is if uh, mental health courts are, a, are better for mental ill than assisted outpatient treatment? Uh, no, um, these courts, the problem solving courts are voluntary. Uh, they're voluntary courts. Is that your question? I think that answers it. So, this is out, a patient, outpatient treatment is when someone gets into the court system involuntarily, and mental health courts, courts are, are, are you saying that the, a person uh, chooses to, to uh, be treated in a mental health court? That's correct. Okay. You know, in the state of Florida, uh, we have not implemented assistant outpatient treatment. Uh, it remains an unfunded mandate. Um, you know, I philosophically uh, prefer, obviously, uh, voluntariness um, in terms of care. And so, uh, and, I'm a and I'm a county judge. That gives me a lot of um, latitude in the sense that I have no I have no authority under Florida statute to commit anybody. Um, and it's circuit judges who do um, AOT and, and, and all of the, the commitment. And I, I'm kind of relieved about that. You know, many years ago, and, and we took a little criticism for this, but back in 2001, uh, I was very fortunate uh, to be appointed by then uh, President uh, George Bush to what was the second presidential commission on mental health, uh, first one under Jimmy, Car under Jimmy Carter, and of course that was all Rosalind's doing, I think. And the President's New Freedom Commission uh, on Mental Health uh, built its final report to the White House around recovery, did not take up the issue of assisted outpatient treatment or forced treatment, and I think that uh, you know, we, that was, a, that was a, a, conscious, a conscious decision because it remains, you know, somewhat polarizing and we really wanted to stay, you know, focused on progress and focused on some of the uh, aspects of, of recovery. So, but no, uh, Broward's uh, problem-solving courts uh, intrinsically are voluntary. Uh, at least that's the way it's supposed to be. Theoretically, under thank, the scholarship. Thank you. I, I wanted to just say one of the areas that, um, for those of you who are uh, 
part of the system in Broward County that I think um, is desperately in need of reform is working in family court. We have so many children who are being forced into relationships with parents who are violent or uh, um, psychologically abusive, the batterers that I describe in the literature. And the uh, family courts here and throughout the United States, it's not just here, uh, do not take that into account. And so these children are being forced to manage to go back and forth um, and spending time with controlling parents who don't get along, and they're in the middle of these battles. What's the alternative? I think we need a, a children's mental health court. And no, on I the think family a family level, mental saying. health court. And family. We talked about that. Yep. We a therapeutic children's <laughs> family mental health court collaborative, yeah. And that's yeah. really what we need to do. And we need a judge like Judge Wren, because um, she's not giving up her, her mental health court, but somebody who has the same philosophy, this, the, because it is a very much a personal um, philosophy uh, who will run that uh, type of, of court. Um, I went to some of the family court judges and said, I'll provide students to help you. Um, because our students need the training. It's win-win, you know. Uh, our students get the training working with a lot of you in the, in the community, and at the same time, um, they're providing a service for your clients as well. Um, but it's a lot of work. Um, we haven't gotten anybody who's really interested in... Because in, in, uh, it is a change in the system. It's easier to just say, okay, 50-50, um, sh time sharing, um, you know, and if you need mental health treatment, go to one of the mental health services, which is... Alrighty. Well, I'm getting a signal uh, that it's time to wrap up. Adam? Yeah, yeah. and um, I want to thank you all for sharing the evening with us. Thank these great ladies for taking the time and having this wonderful literary experience, uh, sharing their books and, and their experiences. I don't know about you, but I was caught between getting all teary-eyed or getting goosebumps. <laughs> and I want to go home, lace up my Timberlands, and do some shit with my life so that I can kind of come even close to what these ladies are doing and the real people that they're helping in very real ways. Um, I want to tell you guys, I have a housekeeping announcement. This was recorded. Uh, uh, it's going to be available next week on nova.edu, French slash DRA, French slash events, if you want to revisit it. Um, and again, I just want to thank Dr. Walker and Judge Lorna Rand. Thank and you. And you. And anybody and that wants to uh, get We're going to sit outside for a while and sign Have a little book books. signing. <laughs> so the party goes on outside. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank